and a very warm welcome to the preview show of the Johnny and Josh show. Great pleasure to have you back. New season, new attitude, new waffles, but tragically the same ugly old mugs. Yes, indeedy. JC, Big Dave and Eric are back. Boys, lovely to see you. Goldie. Oh, hi. Look like you got a spray tan, buddy. Uh, that it, in the off season? I, I may have overdone the Donald look, if I'm brutally honest. Yeah. Goldie, are you running for office? <laughs> Big Dave, I, I took one look at myself in the mirror. I knew that we were going to having a Zoom call, and it, you know, it's like a love affair. It's the renewal of a love affair. This is my idea of Tinder, and I thought, no, I can't look this pasty <laughs> and pale. I'm going to have to get some colour, and I've overdone it because I don't ever do it. I don't know how often to do it. I don't know how to do it. So swiping clearly... left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wish I no, could. No, I'm left saying, right I'm now. saying, the product in the hair is working for you, though. Thank a little you. too orange, but the hair is looking on point. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Boys, lovely to have you back. Uh, the season is upon us. Opening day, would you believe it? April the 1st. I kid you not. April Fool's Day. Well, that's great. <laughs> I can't believe they're going to do that. <laughs> I don't know why you make that. What's the point? Are it's we like, fooling? Like, what are you supposed to say? No, it's not. <laughs> exactly. Wrong, Gouldy. Well, it's, it's ironic. It's ironic with all that's gone before and all that's about to happen. Why is it ironic? I think you're misusing oh, that right. term. Yeah, maybe, it's it's a maybe it's a coincidence. April 1st is yes. day. All right, here's a segue for you. All right, here's a segue for you. Whose birthday would it have been on April the 1st? Whose 83rd birthday? I'll tell you right now, Phil Necro. Oh, How sad is that? That will be coming okay. to that a little bit later. Anyway, we've got loads to do. Uh, we're going to have our usual COVID update. Uh, I can't believe we're still doing this a year down the line. Who would have guessed it? Uh, so officially, hopefully, there's going to be some fans in some or all of the stadiums for a normal baseball season of 162 games. Uh, unbelievably, there's apparently going to be 100% of fans in Texas, the crazy Texans, and, the, uh, and Canada are still uh, keeping the borders closed. So Toronto... I understand, JC, are going to be starting the Major League season uh, down in Florida, but not Buffalo. Why, why not just go back to Buffalo? They did it before. It worked. What's the story? Well, it makes sense, Goldie, so that the team isn't going to have to move twice. If they were to sort of pick up sticks from Dunedin, where they play their spring training, and then go to Buffalo and then hopefully move up to Toronto before midseason, that would be two stops along the way. This way, they get to stay in their spring training facility where they have all their infrastructure and then just make the singular move back up to Toronto. Toronto. I bet you they'll be in Buffalo starting in June. Write it down. What's and the over the, under on that? June's the over under? <laughs> June 1st. Definitely does, in Buffalo. The thing is, it does get pretty chilly in Buffalo. And I've been, and I live in that little neck of the woods for in my youth. And it's April in Buffalo is no fun, especially with no retractable roof. And then the flip side, Dunedin in June is, is rough. That's I mean, why you're going to see them in tough. Buffalo. OK, well, well, we'll revisit that. Well, let's do the uh, news roundup. Thank you for that, guys. Uh, loads to discuss. Um, big news roundup for our first show of the new season. First of all, and this is really, really sad, um, a, a list of Hall of Famers that have lost us since we went off air for our first series. Um, I mean, wow, what a team they've got in heaven right now. Uh, to name but a few, Tommy Lasorda, Don Sutton, Phil Necro, and Hammer Hank Aaron. Boys, uh, well, I know Tommy Lasorda for you, JC. That must have hurt. Yeah, I grew up in Los Angeles, Gouldy, and Tommy Lasorda was more than just a manager for that team, which was just a fantastic team in the late 70s and into the early 80s. He was also a celebrity. He was a person, he was famous for having pictures on this wall and in the manager's clubhouse office of him with Sinatra and all these very famous people. You look at this list, and it's particularly heartbreaking for people who are not your age, Gouldy, you're well past, <laughs> but for, for me, Dave and, and, and Eric, that... You know, last year we lost Al Kaline. We lost players who were sort of that half a generation older than us. When you look at guys like Don Sutton, you look at a guy like Phil Necro, they were pitching in the 80s. These are the players of our childhood, and it's, uh, it's tough to swallow. Well, certainly from my perspective, I mean, I'm gutted to you, to lose Hammer Hank, you know, second only to Chip as my all time favorite player, such a such an absolute gentleman and, and obviously uh, a Milwaukee or Atlanta brave legend, an icon of baseball. Um, and then, of course, Phil Necro as well. Uh, I mean, we really we really have suffered on every level. What about you, Dave? Who have you particularly missed? Well, you know, we talk about Tommy Osorio being the ultimate celebrity and crossover personality in L.A., Don Sutton, probably the opposite. You know, I was talking about this with Eric during the offseason. Have you ever seen a, a pitcher like Sutton, 
300 game winner, fly under the radar, radar so much. That guy, I looked at the records. He holds a lot of Los Angeles Dodgers pitching records, and you just don't hear about Sutton in the way that you hear about other players in his class. The thing about the Dodgers in that era, they were really defined by their infield. They had this infield that stayed together longer than any other infield. It was Steve Garvey, Davey Lopes, Bill Russell, Ron Say. And that was really the focus. But the thing about Sutton and Necro is that these players really made a career by their longevity. Is that they weren't necessarily those shining stars in particular seasons. They were always incredibly good, but never the best in their league. But they lasted for so long. They were the definition of durability. And I think also we do have to point out with Hammer Hank, obviously with the, um, the, the the career home run record, the whole story around that uh, with regards to what he endured to end a season uh, one shy of the record um, and, and, and with what he endured in terms of the horrific racism that went his way. Um, and, and some of the quotes that I've seen, one from Sports Illustrated, is this to be the year in which Aaron at the age of 39 takes a moonwalk above, above one of the most hallowed individual records in American sport? Or will it be remembered as the season in which Aaron, the most dignified of athletes, was besieged with hate mail and trapped by the cobwebs and goblins that lurk in baseball's attic uh, I mean, it, it's it's scary when you consider uh, blm and and the issues that the world is still dealing with just the level of hatred that was directed at a man just because he was about to beat babe ruth's home run record the thing about hank aaron that's really uh, so surprising to me is that i actually think he's underrated in terms of uh, the historical pantheon Everyone sort of thinks, oh, the home run champ. And, you know, even when Barry, uh, Barry Bonds passed him, the home run champ, he was such a well-rounded player. He could hit for average. He was a great defensive player. He should have been up there with the Willie Mays of the world. Maybe not quite as athletic, but certainly in that realm. But people only thought about him in terms of his home runs. He was one of the greatest all-around baseball players to ever play the game. Well, what did they say, Josh, about Mays and Aaron? Mays would wear his cap a little bit light on the head so that when he was running back, his hat would fly off. You'd have all the drama and Hank didn't have any of that. And, you know, a lot of that was probably perception because Hank Aaron was a tremendous defender. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, I remember I'll have a fond memory like is actually with, with, with David. Actually, we were at the, at the World Series in Philadelphia, Citizens Bank Ballpark. Uh, we were doing batting practice, filming uh, interviews and whatnot for channel, the old Channel 5 days. <laughs> and we went into like a, a little break room uh, where there was like, where, you know, the press used to hang out with for press conferences. And here's David and I just sitting there eating our sandwiches out of our media press box, uh, lunch boxes. Little box lunch. Little box lunches. Little and, turkey sandwich. And we're, all there, we're there all, all by ourselves. So today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, and we're just there hanging out, just uh, munching away and talking to MLB international staff. And uh, then in walks Hank Aaron and Mike Schmidt just walking through and they sort of sip. 10 feet away with this and here we are eating his hands huh, Hank Aaron Mike Schmidt yeah and <laughs> and that's when that's when we just sort of like pause for a second in between uh you know bites of your sandwich and think wow that's 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 Hank Aaron is, is this the part where Hank Aaron said hey Eric yes I'm on your chin again yeah, you, got, you got some food there Get, <laughs> just, clean it up, see, all joking apart I'm really sorry but the two of you cannot call yourself true baseball lovers if you've got Hammer Hank in the same room and you don't go up and shake that man by the hand and say you I, are a I had, massive I had, hero. Hey, well, I had he had mustard, he had mustard on his face. Off. Mustard all over my hands. I didn't want to show his... <laughs> <laughs> I would have given off, anything man. to meet Hammer Hank Darren. He, he, uh, he, I, I, would, I would literally be lost for words. We all know how rare that is. It was yeah, a cool def- moment, but it didn't make the sandwich any better, Johnny. <laughs> okay moving on uh very sad very sad and obviously rest in peace true greats of the game we will always remember them uh right moving on to uh, spring training in full swing and when i say in full swing particularly if you're poor old jordan hicks having his first start on the mound with what would have been a new record at bat with regards to the uh, the number of uh, the uh, the number of pitches faced 22 but because it's spring training doesn't count did you see that jc i watched it on on twitter i think it was phenomenal at bat 
I loved it. I loved it for so many reasons, Goldie. First off, it's the definition of baseball, right? That one-on-one -on -one confrontation between the pitcher and the batter. Yeah. Obviously, you have that in cricket. It, it occurs in other sports. But you see the excitement of it in baseball. When you have a pitcher in Jordan Hicks who throws up to 101 miles an hour and then can dial it back with an off-speed pitch at 86, 87 miles an hour, and you have a batter – like uh, uh, Guillaume, Luis Guillaume, who's able to stick in there for 22 pitches. It was amazing. And it's a reminder of how hard this game has become. When you go back to the era of the Don Suttons and the Phil Micros, there was no one out there who could throw 101, let alone be able to dial it back. The game has gotten so challenging. And when you see batters who can hold up, and guys who aren't even superstars, who can hold up for that long in a bat, uh, you just have to tip your cap to them. I don't know if you saw the footage, Dave, but there's some great, great sort of outtakes of the Mets dugout and Pete Alonso in particular going absolutely ballistic. I mean, it got the boys up on their feet and the 40 or 50 fans in the stadium were also getting pretty excited. It was great to watch. And enjoy it while you can, because we all know that in 2024, Rob Manford is going to limit at bats to 10 pitches. So it was really good to see that before it gets eliminated. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be coming to rule changes in a minute because that obviously is a, a little bit of a pointed jest. Sorry, JC, you were going to say. No, I was going to say that uh, it's, it is crazy. It's just uh, amazing to have that many uh, pitches. I think the one thing that you look at, too, that adds to the story is that Jordan Hicks had had Tommy John surgery and had missed uh, you know, pretty much uh, the 2020 season. And he was a type one diabetic. He missed that as well, too, because he opted out. So here's a guy who hadn't pitched in well over a year coming out there and throwing 101 miles an hour. That's the first batter he had faced in practically two years. Unbelievable. Then having his career ruined now by Luis Guillorme, who knows if his arm will ever recover from that 21 <laughs> pitch at bat. Well, spring train craziness isn't just limited to at bats. I can tell you that much. You must have seen the story. And, and this, for me, actually is really sad. Cubs prospect Jesus Cam uh, Camargo, uh, who's been found, was well, stopped, pulled over by the cops, and they found in his Mets uh, locker bag, he had 21 pounds of Mets and 1.2 pounds of oxycodone which I can assume wasn't for personal. 21 pounds of meth? Yeah, tw uh, 21 wow. pounds of meth. That's yeah. heavy. That, 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 that was just, he had a good bag. That was I, 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 got, I asked David, what's the street value, David? I don't have the street value, but I have a question for you. Is, 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 uh, is crystal meth a performance-enhancing drug? That's, is it, I, just, I have no idea. He had oxycodone too. So is the uh, is that up and down? I don't even I don't know my drug paraphernalia well enough. I got I got a bone up on that. Well, and for next episode, just, we'll be ready. And Johnny, it was it was it wasn't a Mets uh, uh, kit bag. It was a Cubs kit bag. So it was Mets uh, Cubs, in sorry, Cubs bag, not meth. not not Cubs in a Mets bag. You know, so <laughs> it, it, it is pretty heartbreaking. So he's he's a, he's from Mexico and uh, from the uh, province of Sinaloa, which is like the center of the drug trade. And you wonder whether you know, he sort of got into bad stuff from the place he's from. Well, guys, I did a quick research on, you know, because this is, I'm, I think I'm right in saying he's never played in the major leagues, but he's been playing in the minors. And, and his numbers, he's a pitcher. You know, his ERA was two point something. I mean, you know, he clearly had a decent arm. Um, but he's now, uh, he's been, I think he has been released. Uh, he'll be going to court in March. I mean, he's obviously going to go down for it. It's, it, I just think it's really sad. You know, you've got an arm, you've got some talent, you've got a career. Why would you throw it away? But there you go. There you go. The ups and downs of baseball. Uh, that's basically the news item, boys. Um, we now need to move forward to that man who's shaking his finger at me, Erika, in game trivia. It is the first trivia of 2021, and I'll make it an opening day trivia uh, for all you wow. gentlemen here. If I can call you that, the uh, April third, nineteen seventy four, opening day. Hammering Hank Aaron was trying to get his seven hundred and fourteenth home run to tie Babe Ruth's record, and he did it. He actually hit the seven one four on opening day, nineteen seventy four. My question to you is, who was batting fifth? In that. I thought you were going to ask who the pitcher was. I knew it was Jack Billingham was the pitcher. So basically, uh, Hank Aaron was the cleanup hitter in that in that box score. My question to you is, who was batting fifth? So basically, who was giving him the high five at home plate when 
when uh, Hank Aaron rounded the bases to claim 714? Is it A, Davey Johnson, who went on to win the World Series with uh, New York Mets as a manager? Or was it B, Joe Torre, who went on to win the World Series multiple times with New York Yankees? Or is it C, Dusty Baker, current manager of the Houston Astros? So who batted fifth in that uh, that famous 7-1-4 game that Hank, Hammer and Hank Aaron hit on opening day 1974? Can I, without offering an answer, because obviously we're not doing that until later, can I offer you some, uh, some uh, story background to this, guys? Uh, this is great. The Atlanta front office apparently considered keeping Hammer, Hammer Hank on the bench during road games so the slugger could try to equal the mark in front of the hometown fans but Commissioner Bowie couldn't ordered the Braves to put the outfield into the lineup for at least two of the three games against the Reds. And, of course, it was in Cincinnati that that home run was hit. So uh, there you have it. That's why the Braves yeah. fans didn't get, in, get, a, get to see him do it in the hometown. But there you go. I've got absolutely no clue. But we're coming back to that, I'm assuming. Yes, yeah, so there we go. So that's yeah. the end of your trivia. We'll be talking about the trivia later on. So on with the game. I just want to point out, Eric. There was, we have our facts are very important here on the Johnny and Josh podcast. There was no high five invented until 1977. That was Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Burke. Glenn Burke of the Dodgers is getting credit for that. Correct. Great, great book coming out on him. And if you read one of my books, <laughs> and, uh, find out more about that story. Oh, the waffles! The waffles. Oh, the waffles. First, waffle first waffle, of 2021. waffle there we go. sighting. <laughs> okay, Nine. that's the bell. Moving on. It's, uh, it's pitch one, it's leadoff batter one, and the big question is, what do we have to expect in the 2021 season? Well, I could tell you back to 162 regular games, obviously. Um, there is no more universal DH, which obviously was a change last season to the National League. Pitchers will be hitting. There is no DH in the National League. Uh, but what is remaining, double headers will still be happening in seven innings. Uh, for, uh, double headers will still be seven innings. And extra innings will begin with an, a runner on second base. And there are no more expanded playoffs. So we had a 16-team expanded playoff. We're back to 10. Uh, JC, what's your reaction to these decisions? Well, if you enjoy the purest nature of pitchers hitting, which will occur this year again in the National League, uh, enjoy it this year because I think this will be the last year you're going to see of this. The collective bargaining is going to occur at the end of the year, and I think that's one thing that's going to certainly go. So we are returning back to that old style for one season. I'm not convinced it's going to uh, last longer than that. The extra runner on uh, to start extra innings, I think was something that actually ended up being very popular. I think that was a surprise uh, that it was so popular amongst fans because it did add a certain level of excitement. Uh, you know, I, I like changes that add to strategy. I don't know if that necessarily does that. It just speeds things up. So I'm not loving that. The thing that matters the most to me is it's, you know, the idea that we're going to be back to 162 games, uh, that that is the most important stat. If we can do that and get back to that length, um, that's what makes baseball special. It's about the long drive over a long period of time and the teams that run that crucible and are able to succeed. Uh, that is one of the factors to me that makes baseball special. I, I'd be honest. I like to think of myself as being dynamic and I'm all in favor of change, particularly if it improves. <laughs> Thank you. If, if it improves the game, if it makes it more exciting, I'm all in favor of the runner on second in extra innings. And it had the desired effect in terms of the number of extra innings games and the average length of those extra innings games. It did shorten them significantly. So all in favor. I love the fact the National League and the American League are different with regards to the DH. I love the fact the pitcher has to hit. If that is going to change, as you are suggesting, I'm gutted to hear that. Dave, you're also a bit of a traditionalist. What are your thoughts? I like the DH. I don't want to talk about it, though, because everybody just talks about it all the time. It's a long goodbye. I agree with Josh. It's going to be gone, which is, you know, a little bit of a shame. But, uh, you know, this could be a long goodbye for a couple of reasons. These guys have to get together with the union to come up with an agreement after this year, and I don't you know, if, if I had a gun in my head right now, I say no baseball next year because these guys can't agree on anything. Oh, that's a whole new discussion, which presumably... That's a whole we... new discussion, but it's a fact. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy what you're watching this year because I don't think you're going to see it next year. Yeah, well, Dave's, well, on, Dave's on point that there is so much tension there right now and so yeah. much disagreement that they're going to have to bridge a very wide divide. 
Well, and part of the tension, presumably, is some of the rule changes that are being um, played out in the minor leagues that Major League Baseball have insisted upon. Uh, JC, can you update us on what those changes are that's only yeah. happening in the minors? Yeah, so Major League Baseball doesn't need any buy-in from the Players Association in order to make changes in the minor leagues. And at each level, they're doing different types of changes, and they're some of them a little nutty. I, I'm not a fan of almost all of them, and we can discuss them each individually after I go through them. So at the AAA level, they're going to play with slightly larger bases, which are less slippery in surface. The reason for this makes it a little easier to steal if you have a little less of a distance to go. At the AA, they're going to require that all four infielders have their cleats within the outer boundary of the infield dirt when the pitch is delivered. Uh, this is to prevent uh, some of the shift opportunities that you might be able to have. At the high A level, they're going to require that pitchers step off the rubber to attempt a pickoff. This makes pickoffs much more difficult to occur, uh, much easier for the runner to identify that and get back. So again, this is trying to help the running game a little bit. At the low A level, they're going to limit to two pickoffs per plate appearance. So you'll be able to be on the mound, but you're only able to throw over twice. If you throw over a third time uh, and do not get the runner, I believe it's a balk. So uh, that would mean that the runner would get to go to second base. Uh, low A in the West, there's going to be a 15-second pitch clock. And then low A in the Southeast only, they're going to do the automatic balls and strike system. So uh, no umpires to call balls and strikes. That's like a Hawkeye, I'm assuming. Yeah. Right, yep. okay. Uh, Dave, what's your immediate reaction? Well, you know, I was with my son the other day, and we were walking around, and I saw some 12-year-old uh, playing baseball, and just for fun, you know, I like to go around and take the temperature, what's going on with baseball and, you know, what kids are th talking about the game. And I said, hey, kids, what do you think of Major League Baseball? What, what gets you excited about baseball? And they said to me, you know, uh, what I would love to see are slightly larger bases that are a little less slippery. And they said if, they, if MLB could bring in slightly larger bases that were a little less slippery, that they would be all over baseball. And that they would, you know, beg their parents to go to games. And that they would, you know, look at box scores every morning and put baseball cards in their, in, in, in their bikes, in their wheels. And so I'm very excited about the prospect of slightly larger, uh, a little less slippery bases <laughs> coming into Major League Baseball. Okay, that's, 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 a, that's a little unfair, Dave, right? Like if the kids said, I want to see more stolen bases, I want to see more running, that's the purpose. So I agree with you, but for a different reason. Look, one of the greatness greatest aspects of baseball are the numbers, right? 60 feet, six inches. That has not changed in well over a hundred years. 90 feet baselines. There's a symmetry to it and there's a constancy to that. Figure out other ways, but this one is, is, is stupid to me. I understand that the mound was lowered, so there have been some changes, but the distances have not changed. By expanding the bases, you change the distances a little bit. Uh, to me, that's one purest aspect that does not relate to creating better strategy and, and i really don't like it the quote i heard was bigger bases are lit so it's obvious that the kids are behind it let's do it okay well it's a it's a debate that's going to run and run and no doubt we're going to return to it uh, my understanding is that I, i've always thought that the first base looks like an accident waiting to happen when it comes to turning ankles and injuries and if they've got a, a slightly bigger base, which is going to be less inclined towards injury, then that's a good thing because welfare is always important. But, that, but that's not really why they're doing it, Goldie. They're doing no, no, it. To I appreciate it. that. I appreciate yeah, the, that. The bigger issue, though, Goldie, really is this effort to end uh, any sort of shifts. And I think that there's definitely a split on what people feel about yeah. that. I like shifts. I think that's a strategic choice. If you're a player, baseball is all about making adjustments. That's that's ingrained in the game. So make an adjustment. Hit the other way. Don't play absolutely pure pull baseball then you know beat the shift and so i don't like the idea that you're going to change that rule in order to try and make it easier for those pull hitters to play the game that they played previously yeah I'm look 100 if you, if you pitch that. faster the game will go faster it's really yeah. easy all you have to do is turn on a game from the 70s i know they had less their pitch selection was a little less refined back then and then you know they were more likely to you know hit first but but, but, but Dave faster but Dave, but do you enjoy watching a pitcher constantly going to first place to hold the runner and do it again and again and again? It doesn't happen as much as you think because nobody's oh. trying to steal. 
whenever it does happen. There's a lot happen. of holding on going on. But, yeah, but, but, I, but stealing's cool, great. Cool. I love stealing. So anything they can do to enhance the stolen I, I love the I love the payoff. Go back to the playoffs between the Yankees and the Red Sox in 2004, where you had Dave John Dave Roberts on first base. Everyone knew he was going to steal. There was so much back and forth. That was part of the tension before he stole. Was you know could he be picked off? Could he be held a little closer? That's part of that battle. Those those one on one battles in baseball. But they're not I, stopping I, that. They're just li- they're just looking to limit it in terms of that you can't do it. Yeah, but what's once you limit it, you, you, you change it completely. If you say you can only do two times, I mean, what's the point? Okay. Stepping off also changes it, too. If you have to step off and throw over, that doesn't really do anything. But, that but, that, but that's about encouraging stolen bases because it gives an emphasis to the, the stealer rather than to the pitcher. Is that not meant to be positive? Because that's an aspect of the game that's deemed to be more exciting. You want to see stolen bases, the therefore make it a little steal. bit easier. Johnny, the reason they don't steal is because the number crunchers have figured out it's not, it, it, you know, it's just not a good baseball move. Right, but to Johnny's point that if it becomes a better baseball move and the, the anoraks determine that with the step off, you can steal more than you will see more stolen bases. Well, all right, fair enough. Yeah, yeah it makes my fancy baseball team a lot easier to select. Anyway, I think I heard a, a bell there. Was that a yes, bell? That was a bell. It was, uh, so basically, that was that, well, we're going we're gonna to see how these – well, I say, God forbid, we see these 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 rule changes in the major league level. Uh, one more thing that we can look forward to in the year 2021, this season, is as it stands, where the All Star Game will still be going on. It'll be in Atlanta this year. It'll be Yay! it'll be July 13th. Allegedly, they're going to say it'll be full capacity, 100% capacity. I'll believe that when we when we see it. Don't know how the state of Georgia is doing right now with their COVID situation, but at the moment, opening day uh, hasn't even started yet, but there will be an All-Star game on July 13th, and that'll be the All-Star break. Eric, no one's more of a piercing. You go to the Church of Baseball more regularly than any man I know. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Moving on. Can it be, why can't it be a mosque or a synagogue of baseball? Fair enough. Good point. Your 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 <laughs> religious observance location of baseball of your choice. Thank you. Thank you for your inclusiveness. I want to give you a big hug. Post post COVID times. Mark me down. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Okay, it's pitch number two, guys. It's players on the move. Some obvious big names: Trevor Bauer, uh, Francisco Lindor, Nolan Arenado, Blake Snell, and you Darvish, both going to the Padres. Big day. What do you make of the big moves? Well, the, the number one most annoying move is probably the most obvious move is Nolan Arenado to the Cardinals. You park this guy at third base forever. He becomes another wholesome, fresh, beautiful St. Louis legend in that, you know, beautiful St. Louis. Everybody loves baseball and they're such great fans. And Nolan Arenado becomes that next guy, right? So we know that we know that that's all perfect in you know in the uh, little house on the prairie of baseball over there in St. Louis. Wait, hey, uh, what, what's your problem with St. Louis? Well, uh, St. Louis, you know, oh, they love the best fans, and oh, they love their the, the Cardinal way, and they oh, love oh my lord, you are ravioli that sucks. You need I to get know. out of New York. You need to get no, out no, of New no. York. No, no, no. I'm with David. I guess I don't know if it's an East Coast thing, but yeah, it's, it's, screw St. Louis. Hey, we went to St. Louis. I loved it there. I thought the St. Louis. Was and that Prevel pizza. Get out of here with It's that. a nothing town. What? Nothing what? town. Nothing what? going on. Nothing. Excuse me. Meet me in St. Well, they said St. Louis. I never understood that. Meet me in St. Louis. Um, better for the song. Absolutely. Yeah, well, there, man. Yeah. Judy Garland. Come on. No, St. Louis. You just don't like them because they do it right, and they do it right oh, year in, it year so out. Right, they're so good. You're they right. are. They well, are the second most World Series you, in, in. Don't be a hater, Dave. Dave. Dave you are the least. such a hater. Wow. <laughs> okay, move on from Arenado. What about Trevor Bauer? He was dominating the social media headlines. He's another Finally one. He's What's another wrong? one. So he, yeah. He spends all, too much guy, time indoors. He is. First of all, the guy loves himself like nobody you know we've ever seen you know in the last twenty years. He loves himself. Uh, you know, this, the funny thing about Bauer is you want to give him credit for some things. Like, he hires a female agent. That's cool. You know, even though he's only giving her a flat rate and paying her hourly, he's, you know, he hired a female agent. That's great. Uh, some of his takes on, on baseball are very good. But then you, it's really hard to get around the fact that, you know, he's just kind of an asshole. So as they say, you know, as, as somebody said on Twitter, what is it, like uh, the old, an old ad is like, you know, you have this cousin – 
he's right, but he, you know, hey, Walter, you know, you're saying a lot of things that are right, but you're still an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, it's you know. it's really interesting. So uh, Trevor Bauer and Garrett Cole were teammates at UCLA, um, which if you grow up in Southern California, that is the baseball school everyone wants to go to. And the people who end up going there because it had such a great history, even though they didn't win a lot of college uh, World Series championships, such a great history, such a great facility. And the guys that ended up there tended to be prima donnas, big egos about themselves Cole and Bauer uh, historically have hated each other um, because their egos are so strong and so yeah, big. They're probably alike. Right. It manifests itself slightly differently, right? Bauer's a little bit more look at me. Cole isn't as much look at me. But it's interesting to, to follow that dynamic. And I agree with you, Dave, about, about Bauer. I want to like him because I like that he's different, but he's just too much about himself. Yeah, guys, I've got to play devil's advocate here. If there's one thing that Major League Baseball really, really needs, it's it's Asshole. stories. No, it's <laughs> stuff, it's space, it's fun. It's people to get the youngster to engage. The one thing you've got to say about Bar, bit marmite, I'll accept that. You either hate him or you love him. The reality is you can't ignore him. I mean, someone like Mike Trout, he's been the best player in baseball. I'm not even sure I know what he looks like. He never seems to have any kind of a story attached to it. And I know in some people's eyes, that's why he's such a great player and why he's such a great person. But but sport needs personalities. And baseball is horribly shy of personalities. But now Gouldy, you, you, he's gone. Gouldy, you, you hit the nail on the head in that he's either hated or loved, right? He's yeah. bringing attention. I happen to dislike him, but I'm going to pay attention to him. So yeah, you're totally. getting that result, which is you're getting people to pay attention to baseball. Just, I, I just don't like him. I appreciate that he's out there. I appreciate all the things you're saying. I think it's good for baseball that he is that personality. Just, I fall down on the dislike side of it. All right, but I'm worried about Dave because his blood pressure is going through the roof. You must be happier with the arrival of Francisco Lindor to the New York Mets. That's got to make you smile, Dave. Oh, yeah. It's great to have a franchise player. So, you know, there's the, the, the old Met in me says, oh, man. They're not going to resign him next year. Something's going to happen. Something's going to go wrong. And then the new Met inside me says, well, you've got Uncle Stevie there writing checks. Stevie Cohen being the, the new, extremely loaded uh, and wanting to win owner of the New York Mets now that Fred Wilpon and, and Jeff are gone. Uh, but then, you, you know, just, you know, it's a great deal, obviously. It puts, it puts a cornerstone at shortstop. You just want to make sure it goes on beyond this season. But, uh, yeah, no question about it. Uh, you've got a player built for New York. Great smile, great swing, great glove. I mean, there's really no downside to him whatsoever. And we're happy to have him. Gouldy, I cannot believe we haven't talked about the San Diego Padres if we're talking change. Oh, I was getting there. That was my last one. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I mean, and if ever there was a statement that we want to compete, when you consider they're in the same division as the Los Angeles Dodgers, by Jove, they needed to spend money, and they have. And I can tell you one thing, in terms of payroll, they're up to the ninth largest payroll. Two seasons back, they were 24. That is a statement of intent by San Diego. And that's two great pickups. You, you've got to love what they've done, Blake Snell and you, Darvish. You, you excited? Yeah, absolutely. But I think it goes beyond that because they really helped build out their bullpen. Going out and getting Mark Melanson, who you saw with the Braves, pitched yeah. up the Giants, had closing experience. And Kano Kella as well, two relievers who have closing experience that give you that depth at the back of the bullpen. Fantastic. And then Joe Musgrove, adding him to the back of your starting rotation is huge. And then Ha Seong Kim may ultimately be a really solid player. At the worst, a super utility guy who gives you more depth there as well. So it wasn't just, hey, we got these couple marquee names, which is fantastic in you, Darvish and Blake Snell, but we really short up all the other elements of our roster to make us competitive on all levels of the dot and out west. I feel badly for you, Darvish. You know why? Because he had his life ruined by the Houston Astros, got lit up in the 17 World Series by the Astros, who knew everything that was coming. The guy goes through two years of introspection, gets finally gets his game back, and now he's in the uh, NL West, and he's got to face the Dodgers 19 times. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, I, but yeah, but you're also play, playing against the Rockies. Admittedly, you go to Coors. No, I know. I go and you're, yeah, you're, and he's, he's pitching in San Diego, which is a great pitcher's park. Yeah, he's going to love that. He's going to love absolutely. the weather. I, I, I wish him all the best. Diego. He's a wonderful player. 
I think the other really interesting aspect to the offseason in terms of the hot stove, Goldie, were the players who chose to stay with the teams that they had previously been with. So you had Justin Turner staying with the Dodgers, JT yep. Real Muto staying with uh, the Phillies, and DJ LeMahieu staying with the Yankees. And you usually see players of that level leveraging their relationships with the previous teams to go elsewhere. And then those three players decided to stay at home uh, speaks partially to the market, that the market isn't as strong as it might have been in the past where you had that one team going over the top, and partially that you know they're with good organizations and they all think that they have a chance winning with, with their various teams. One player you guys uh, we didn't mention. Marcelo Zuna. No. Oh, he's a good one. Thank you. Who Can't did believe we didn't mention him. Can Can believe. Believe. That guy is the worst defending outfielder amongst high price players. We'll take it. Out there. We'll take it. Built, uh, the built, for the, built for the DH. They were praying for the DH in Atlanta. <laughs> we were. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and they were praying for the DH in New York, believe it or not, except not me. Uh, but uh, how about George Springer? And then with all the work yeah. that the Jays have done him, you know, you talk about a player who left his team, left the homestead after seven or eight years or whatever it was. And now he's heading up north or down south or a little less south or who knows, wherever, Buffalo. for Toronto. There we well, go. But the, just to just add one more on that with the Blue Jays, I think an equally important pickup was Marcus Simeon, who's totally. you know, a veteran yeah, at shortstop who's going to be a huge anchor uh, for that young team along with Springer. I think you needed a couple of old, older guys, established guys. But are they going to play him second base? Because they've got Bo Pichette. So I'm assuming he's going to. Where's be... the waffle? Bring out the waffle. <laughs> yeah, the waffle. I'm hitting a waffle with a, with a bell. The waffle <laughs> hitting the bell. bell. <laughs> The Belfort. Okay, now and, and as well, one more thing. Uh, Liam Hendricks uh, has, you know, uh, left the Oakland A's, signed by the Chicago White Sox. That'll be an, uh, an interesting addition to Tony La Russa's White Sox in 2021. Moving on. Thank you, Eric. As always, the man on the bell. Uh, we now are focusing with our third pitch of the, of the show on team predictions. Um, I'm going to throw mine out. We're going to focus, first of all, on the National League. I'm going to throw mine out. JC, I want you to be the first to respond. And then I'm looking for some dark horses from Big Dave and Eric. So National League, um, the East, I'm going, obviously, Brave. Central, I'm going the Brewers. And West, well, what a shock horror. I'm going the Dodgers. All right, so I'm going East. I'm going to go with the Mets. There you go, David. That's what? a good one for you. I actually, well, because I think that if the Mets can be solid enough until Syndergaard and Carrasco come back, they're going to have the best rotation. Sure, you know, obviously Washington's good, but, you know, the Mets, I think, have a little more depth. Plus, the Steve Cohen factor, I think, will be, they're going to be a team that are going to be willing to go out and spend some money. I'm a big fan of Marcus Stroman. I think Taiwan Walker could be better. So I think they have a lot a lot to work with there. Central, I'm going with the cards. I think uh, the addition of Arenado is, is a huge one. If they can get uh, Adam Wainwright one more good season out of him and a healthy Carlos Martinez in a weak division, I think they can pull that out. And, you know, obviously the West is going to be a coin flip. I'm going with the Padres. Uh, the reason for that is that I think wow. they're more hungry than the Dodgers. I think they have both teams have tremendous depth in pitching. I think the Dodgers slightly better offense, but I think that that hunger piece may put them over the top. They may not win the division, but I think the Padres have a chance to go deeper in the postseason. Wow. Okay. Well, the the, the question was who's going to win the division, which you've obviously just ignored. Uh, what no, about I... the dog? Because <laughs> you right, just <laughs> keep going, Goldie. Okay, dog horses. Big day. Well, dog horses. You know. I'm going to go in the NL. I'm going to go with Miami because why not? I mean, they made the playoffs. No one's talking about them. Don Mattingly has a whole spring training to learn everybody's name. They were pretty well balanced. They had a very nice bullpen. And, you know, uh, that's very helpful these days. And they may have a chance to compete for a playoff spot, which I think would, you know, make them a dark horse. Wouldn't you agree, uh, Josh? 150%. 150%. I, I think last year felt like a short season aberration. And if they're able to make the playoffs in a full season, you, you, you will get a high five from me, a Glenn Burke high five. Well, their odds in the world series is 50 to one. So that is really a true dark horse. What about you, Eric? Who are you going for? Well, that's the thing when you th- what is it? The, the term dark horse supposed to insinuate. It means somebody who's done better than they did the year before. And 
I was going to no, say Pittsburgh. that's wrong. That's well, no, not wait, 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 okay. it's it's like, better than the year before. Yeah, it's Dark Horse is somebody's unexpected success. Unexpected, exactly. exactly. So you wouldn't expect, you know. I mean, well, if you make a lot of uh, off-season acquisitions, all of a sudden it doesn't matter what you did the year before. It's a different exactly. team. Exactly. So, I mean, I could easily say the Pittsburgh Pirates are a dark horse because they can't go any <laughs> further south oh, than they did wow. earlier. But no, I, but lawyer it up there. I will. I will actually go with Milwaukee. But, but even though Johnny tipped them to, to win the the NL Central, I can say they were dark horse. Yelich was you know wasn't healthy now he last season, but now he's healthy this season. I'm going to say it's a weaker NL Central this year, and that's why the Milwaukee Brewers are my dark horse for 2021 in the NL. Okay, strictly not a dark horse since I've tipped them. But not to worry, that's just splitting hairs. We'll focus now on the American League. JC, I'm going with in the East, and I think I am going for a dark horse. I'm going with Toronto. I'm loving the Blue Jays hitting lineup. I just think they'll hit more runs than anyone else. And the Yankees are just too injury prone and too old. Uh, The Central, I'm going with the White Sox, who are, for me, one of the most exciting teams that I'm so looking forward to seeing this season. And in the West, I still love the A's. I love Oakland. What's your thoughts? Okay, well, I'm uh, going with the Yankees uh, over the Blue Jays. I think it's a fair pick to pick the Blue Jays. I think that they're not a dark horse. I think they could easily pull away with it. Uh, But I'm just saying that if you can even get a little bit of the old version of Corey Kluber and Jamison Talion, that that team is going to be strong enough with their offense. And obviously, you're going to need guys like Stanton and Judge to stay healthy. Yeah, I know. It's, it, you know, it, they're question it's marks. It's never going to happen. It's never happened. But, but, Why would okay, it happen? But, Gouldy, with, with the Blue Jays, Robbie Ray is your number two pitcher. Like, you need yeah, him yeah. to be the pitcher he was 10 years ago yeah, yeah, in yeah. order for that team to be good. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're always questions. Yeah, but they bat one to nine. So I'm just thinking they'll hit more runs and they'll give up. And they'll give yeah. up a shed load. And, and the Yankees bat one to nine pretty close as well, too. So, yeah. you know, I think offensively it's even. And now you're looking at bullpen. Zach Britton needs to get healthy for the Yankees. Certainly, that'll be a huge part of it. Central White Sox, for sure. I mean, I agree with you. They're just the runaway team. I think you need D- Dallas Keuchel to sort of be kind of the pitcher he was last year in order to make that work yeah. as the third pitcher. I think that's a huge piece of it. And Lance Lynn's had injuries in the past, too. So they could fall apart part pitching wise, but I think that they have to be the prohibitive favorites. And I'm actually going to go with the dark horse in the West. I'm going to go with the angels. Oh, oh, no! dark horse. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, join the club there. <laughs> Davy Langell. Come, 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 come to my home. Obviously you got trout. You have now Rendon. I think, <laughs> I, I think, I think David Fletcher underrated, but I think their pitching staff can be quite good. I think, Dylan Bundy is a pitcher who has the skill, has always sort of underperformed. Andrew Heaney, solid pitcher. Jose Quintana is quite good. Alex Cobb was good when he was with the Rays. He just had to go to the Dante's third ring of the Inferno, Baltimore, for too many years. But I think he could bounce back. I like this team. I, you know, I don't know if Otani is going to be the pitcher that we've always hoped to be, but the type of offense he's put up in spring training suggests that he might be able to bounce back. And if you have him, Trout, Rendon, Fletcher, you've got a pretty good offensive team. Big Dave, he's stolen your thunder, big guy. You wanted to go with the Angels, did you? <laughs> yeah. Silence. Oh, Davey, Davey, you need a hug. Yeah, I yeah. You need a hug. <laughs> is there anyone else? Is there anyone else you want to mention? Uh, I think I think there's a you know if you if you you know what what's the best thing in sports as we've kind of alluded to earlier the best thing in sports is defi- is beer is a cheap, popcorn is beer popcorn. tailgating <laughs> yeah barbecues and, and beating expectations there's nothing you know it's I know the Cinderella about, story I know we don't talk about other sports but like you know the Knicks have been so bad for so long they come out this year and they're 500 and you feel like you feel amazing as a Knicks fan. You know, it's like the greatest thing you've ever seen. Uh, I think that Seattle could have some of that. I think they're going to bring Kellenic up. He's going to run wild and make every Mets fan cry in their beer for the next 10 years. And uh, there could be a real rub off that. You know, I, I'm not saying that they're going to compete for a playoff spot, but I think that they could be a lot better than they were last year. You're, you're using an Eric Jansen definition of... Dark yes, horse. what is the true definition of dark horse? <laughs> I, Josh, you're supposed to you write books on this stuff. You're supposed I, to if, know if what the, the definition of dark if horse you, is. If, like if you, well, if you pick up the uh, field guide to sports metaphors, there is an entry okay. on the term dark horse. So is I, that right, Sort of wasted here. Never but, heard uh, of it. Well, I would have I'm, done I'm, sure, I'm sure it'll be a book of the week from Eric for sure, <laughs> right? Right, <Gould? laughs> Well, let's see. So my dark horse, by the way, thanks for asking, uh, the, is uh, the, um, the Oakland A's. 
Oh. Because, hey, they're the dark first place every dark horse. Wow. What? They're the dark horse every year because, hey, it's Moneyball. Uh, but no, come on. They kept Mac Olson. They got Elvis Andrews now. Oh, oh wow. That's a real different. But, hey, by the way, uh, speaking of the Oakland A's, uh, Sean Murphy uh, is back. But I don't know if you heard this in the off season, but he had like a, 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 a punctured lung that he didn't know about. Like he drove himself to the hospital in the off season. He was having chest pains. He, had, he thought he had COVID, showed up in the emergency room. And then they said, we have to operate immediately. And he had like a a de- like a, a, a punctured lung or something that uh, there was some uh, of this sort and now he's back uh and that's why you know the oakland a's are a dark horse because they're a cinderella story yeah, but they're, they're they're just like the tampa bay rays right they're teams that will always defy the odds it's like calling them a dark horse is like the safest dark horse ever because they well, have such a great front office they figure it exactly. out hey i know my dark horses Hey, do you? So first of all, when it comes to MLB, you've mentioned two teams that I've predicted are going to win divisions, but you've said they're dark horses. And from what a little birdie told me, young Eric, Mm -hmm. your dark horses that you came out with on your NHL pod have been absolute shockers. True. Oh, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, and on the NHL podcast that I do, uh, Slapshot Smack Talk, by the way, at Slapshot Talk. Good title. Um, yes. Uh, the uh, Yes, I, I picked the Buffalo Sabres and the San Jose Sharks to be dark horses. And how are they doing? They are rock bottom. They are the, <laughs> they're the worst teams in the you, you You realize, Eric, that this whole show, Gouldy has been like vulturing, waiting for the moment to bring that up. To, He's to like, my carcass. like drooling so excited to just give you gruff. Yeah, I was okay, just anyways, looking uh, for the lead in. Absolutely. Let's hope my MLB uh, dark horses are better than my NHL dark horses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there goes the bell. It's time for seventh inning stretch. You know, because it's our preview show, we're not gonna we're gonna hold off the pop culture. There'll be plenty of pop culture to look forward to uh, in this 2021 season. Once the season gets underway, we'll be talking films. We'll be talking uh, baseball references and TV shows, and Josh of course, we'll, books. we'll do a books of the week of some sort from Josh some Chetwin authors. <laughs> uh, actually, you know what? Because uh, opening day, okay, I'll, I'll I gotta say I gotta throw in this book because Josh, you must agree that. Uh, why Time Begins on Opening Day by Thomas Boswell is should be the book of the week going you, into you, opening day. You know, t- talking books, though, Eric, I don't know whether you're going to use this because you like your cheat sheets, but Sabre, Sabre oh. Metrics is based on the Society for American Baseball Research. They did their top 50 books of the last 50 years. It's their 50th anniversary. So they have a ton of good books on that list. So. My list well, is better. number one? Well, I got to You put it out there. Now, they they the didn't book? do one through 50. They just listed here are 50. Ah. 50 Spineless. Ones. There's some great Spineless ones. Spineless and Saber. The, the, my list is better. Ignore them. Uh, yeah. So, yes, but uh, that's where we're going to – we have a whole season ahead of us, folks. Stand by for more seventh inning stretch stuff as, as the season continues. Uh, but I will put your minds at the test because, hey, let's face it, the trivia question that I asked you earlier on the show, which I will now give you the, reveal the answer once you give me your guesses. Uh, it was pretty much a grapefruit. I threw you a grapefruit, didn't I? It was a pretty easy question. And just to reiterate the question, I asked you when Hank Aaron hit home run number 714 to tie Babe Ruth's record in 1974 opening day, who was fifth in the lineup that would batted after Hank Aaron? Was it A, Davey Johnson? Was it B, Joe Torre, or was it C, Dusty Baker? So who batted fifth in that Atlanta Braves lineup in that opening day, 1974, after he hit 714? And who will I go for first? I will go with uh, Johnny Gould. I'm going A, and I have no idea why. And who's? Oh. Yeah, I was going Davey Johnson, too. I was going to oh. go Davey Johnson. Oh, all yeah. going Davey Johnson. I'll go, because then if we're wrong, it will just be classic train wreck. <laughs> I'll tell okay. you why I was going to go Davey Johnson. Why? Because... I know that Baker and Aaron played together for a little bit, but I'm not 100% sure they were on the team at the same time. Uh, I think he was already in either. I think he was in San Francisco or LA by the by the time 74. No, I, I think he was there. He was there in 74. You think he was there? I, I'm pretty sure. I remember his his, his 1974 baseball card um, back when I collected. Who? The I wasn't. Card. I was born up uh, two months Dusty later. Dusty Baker. So I remember. Dusty Baker was. Okay, still- so. So the final answer, all you guys are going Davey Johnson, who went on to 
I managed many major league teams, including an 86 uh, World Series with the New York Mets. And who made the last out of the 69 World Series, didn't he? Yeah, and, and arguably, the, in terms of winning percentage, the best manager not in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, he yeah. should be in the Hall of Fame, no question. Yeah. Okay, go. so in no particular order, uh, let me let's go over the answers here. So you, you guys have gone with with Davey Johnson was batting fifth, right? So first of all, Joe Torre is not it, correct. Was not at the Atlanta Braves at that time. He was not playing that game. He was, was already at the St. Louis Cardinals. Right uh, so he was not an answer. But Davey Johnson was indeed in the lineup, uh, but he batted sixth. No. <laughs> Damn. I knew Dusty Baker was there. Daddy, so. Dusty Baker was batting fifth, and Dusty Baker was batting fifth as well when he was uh, when he broke the record. Uh, so that's the end of that trivia. We're gonna have more trivia and pub culture. Stick around, folks. We're gonna have a we're, we're gonna have fun this year, right, Johnny? And Indeed, how, Eric. How can you get hold of us? Are you trying to apply we didn't have fun last year, <laughs> guys? This year we really will have fun. We promise. <laughs> we'll try. We'll, we'll, we'll at least try. Well, we want everybody to have fun. We want all our listeners to get involved. Uh, that is our remit. So do get in touch. You know the details on Facebook, The Johnny and Josh Show, on Twitter, at Johnny and Josh. If you've got questions, if you've got comments, if you want to slag us off, it doesn't matter. We just want to hear from you. We want to know that there's somebody out there listening. Otherwise, it's four old men chatting to themselves on Zoom. It all gets very depressing. Don't forget also, in the same fantasy stable, we've got Behind Home Plate at BHP Pod. Yes, indeedy. Jamesy Holden and JG are back for another season of fantasy baseball. If you want the best seats in the house, make sure you join Behind Home Plate. And after all, James Holden helped me become a double title winning champion. Don't know if I've mentioned that before, but I will mention it again. There's and we've got other shows. We've just also mentioned, Eric's mentioned Slapshot Smack Talk. That's at Slapshot Talk. I love that name, Eric. And that is, of course, the NHL podcast. And then there's Anytime NBA Show at Anytime NBA Show. And that is, of course, the basketball uh, podcast that is all part of the Ted Fred stable. Do join us, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all the usual social media channels. Subscribe, get involved, and be a part of the family. Add Boys, Johnny and Josh. Add Johnny and Josh. Add Johnny and Josh. Did I not mention that? I thought I did that at the beginning. I did. What I am think. I, Chop Liver? <laughs> Johnny and, it should be called Johnny and Josh and Chop Liver. That's what did, the show is. Do you know, Dave, you jest, but this is a conversation <laughs> JC and I have had, that you, you boys are such an important part of this that, we, we do feel a bit bad about the fact that the name of the show ignores the two of you. I as know. Though they, you know no, we're we're so the you, end. It's all right. I like the chop liver. We can just get that. Johnny and Josh and company. <laughs> and friends. And friends. Yeah. Good friends. <laughs> Guys, it's been great. It's so lovely to see you. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's been the highlight of my week. I've been looking forward to seeing you, all three of you. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, we've got another bait stall season to look forward to as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, right. Johnny Gould. And Thank friends. you for having us. <laughs> As you can see, we're at that time. That's it from us on the Johnny and Josh Show. Thanks for listening. Look forward to having your company throughout the Major League Baseball season. From us all, bye-bye.